In this video, we'll cover how to work with relational databases. It could be any of the ones you see in the screen, MariaDB, SQLite, MySQL, or Postgres. In the video description, you will find several links in which I describe what happens during the video and which topics I cover throughout the video. So to get started, the first thing we need to do, and let's do this right away, we are going to download SAM. And with this application, we will have access to the database and we will have access to the GUI. In this case, the GUI will be phpMyAdmin. It's not related to web only, but the fact that I just use phpMyAdmin is because it's a very easy program to interact with. So if you go to SAMP, you Google for it. Click on this link, apachefriends.org, and go to the download tab. Download the version that matches your system. In my case, I have already downloaded the version that I need. I'm not going to uninstall it and reinstall it for you because I have a lot of things happening with SAM. You can also, if you want it, you can download, I think it's spelled like this, WAMP, just like that, WAMP. This will do the exact same thing. I am not using this, I haven't used it for quite a long time, but you could use it. Or you can also download something called MAM and then go to this link and then you will just download it and install it. That's for Mac, MAM. But all in all, if you're using Windows, Linux or Mac, you can just use SAM. This will do the job. Once you have installed SAM in the default location, it will be installed under UPC, under C, and then you will most likely have a folder called XAMP or SAMP. Inside this folder, if you go to it, you will find the SAMPcontrol.exe, that's the executable file. When you open it, I will double click on it, you will get to this window, and let me just close that. And in this window, you can see that you can start the Apache server. This video is not about creating a web application, but since we will connect to the GUI for the database via the web, we will start the Apache server, and we will also start the database, which is MySQL. So you have to click on both of them. If for any reason you cannot start the Apache server, it's because you port 80 or 443 is used by another application and you will need to change the port. To change the port number, if that was the case, you will have to go to config, click on it, and go to service and port settings. Over here you can change the main port, the main port for Apache, most people will use 8080. I'm not going to change it, but you know that it is possible. So I will just abort, in your case, if you change it, you click on save. So now my Apache and MySQL is running fine. I can just close this. And when you close it, it's actually going to be running in the system tray. You can do a test. You can go to localhost forward slash phpMyAdmin, which is just the GUI for the database. In this case, I will walk you through which database we're using and all that. So before we get there, I can also mention that you could download MySQL, I think it's called Workbench. I have not used this for many, many years, but you can download this piece of software and it will just allow you to interact with the database as well. So if that's what you want. There's also something called SQL Yoke. I used this for many years ago. It was quite good. So if you want to download this application, you can also, also go ahead and download it. But you don't need any of those. The only thing you need is PHP my admin, and you get to it via the browser and pointing to localhost. Now, before we start using the GUI for the database, let's create a simple database in a spreadsheet so we can normalize it. And this is the entry point for any database. You should have the normalization in place. You should never use advanced GUI programs that allow you to create class diagrams and then connections and interactions. Just use a simple spreadsheet 
and then you will fill it up with data and you can spot if the database is normalized or not. This course, this video is not about database normalization, but I want to walk you through it pretty quickly. If we had a user's table, we will have an ID, we will have the name, the email, and we can just do the age of the user. You could also put the country of the user where this user lives. So for now we can say country. The ID will be an integer. This is, by the way, very simple. When I go to PHP my admin, I will show you how we do the correct data types. The name will be a bar chart. The email will be a bar chart as well. I will talk to it more about it in a second. The age will be an integer. And the country will be also an integer. Since this is the country, being an integer, let's say that we have country 1 and 2, and this is the ID 1 and 2 for the users. The name is A, the name is B, the mail is at A, at B, and let's say that the age is 10 and 20. Since this is the table with the columns, 1 and 2 is the country ID, so in principle we can say country ID here. I will make a change on it. Let's for now stick to country underscore ID. So we need the countries table. So if I create the countries table, I can say that the country has an ID and the country has a name. The ID will be an integer, more about data types in a second, and the country name will be a bar chart. So this will be the table countries. Let me just highlight it like so, bold it. Country with ID 1 and country with ID 2. The name will be, let's say, Denmark, where I'm recording this video at the moment, and the other country will be USA. This means that user 1 with this data lives in country 1, and country 1, which is this country, is Denmark. And user with ID 2 lives in country 2, and country 2 is the United States. So this is how this database is connected. This one and these two, they will be the primary key for this table. So we can do a PK. And this is the identifier for each user. And what we have here, this one relates to this table here. That means that this will be the foreign key. So instead of doing country underscore ID, we could do FK country. So this is the foreign key to the country. If we had another table, I would make this table here in purpose, call it friends. So pretend that user one is friends with user two, and now we just add a new friend. So we can make this a little bit more advanced. C is 30 years old, and C also lives, let's say, in the United States. So we have a friends table. So we could say that the user ID which will be the main user, has a friend. So we can say FK and we can say user ID. This is quite weird, but just imagine that this is the friend that likes to be friends with somebody else. So we can say that user ID 1 is friend with user ID 2. That means that A is friend with B. It doesn't mean that B is friends with A. It's not the opposite relation. We can also say that B, being ID 2, is friends with C, and C has ID 3. So now we know that A is friends with B, B is friends with C, and let's pretend for the sake of this exercise that 1, which is A, is also a friend of C. So that would be 3. So right now we have this relationship between keys in the same table via the friends table. This table here is a junction table, junction table, because it is linking two different things. And the table countries is a lookup table because it allows us to look at this table to get some data. It is very important to note that this relation between 1 and 2, 2, 3 and 1, 1, it cannot be repeated, meaning that if user A is friends with user B, that means 1 and 2, you should not be able to do a 1 and 2 again. 
So to constrain the table from doing this, this relation between both keys, one and two in this case, is called a compound key. Compound key or composite key. So the same thing will be between two and three, cannot repeat. So this will be a compound or composite key. And the same thing happens over here. So all this relation means that it's a compound key. And what it means, it is that you cannot do one and two again because one and two has been already set up and therefore this cannot be repeated. All right, so now let's go to PHP my admin and then we're going to do all this via the GUI that allows us to interact with the database. So in PHP my admin, let's just hit the path and you will not have all these databases they are here because i was doing some tests what it is important for you is that you can just click on this hide panel that's what you need and what you will do is just click on the databases tab and you will have all the databases we're going to create a database in a second let's just click back again in server and you can see all the information about your database. In this case, my server is using MT, UTF-8, MB4, Unicode CI, which means that I can store or record the emojis in the database. It's going to be Unicoded and it's case insensitive. That's the CI is standing for. If you put your cursor on top of any of the options, you can just read more about them. So you can see that this is Unicode case insensitive. Don't worry about the theming. What it is important for you is to know that we're using localhost, that's 127.0.0.1, and we have the server that is MariaDB. Maybe you're using MySQL, same, same. Maybe you're using Postgres or SQLite, the same thing. It doesn't matter what relational database you're using. And then you have a lot of other information that is not important for us at the moment. So let's go to the databases tab and let's create our database. Let me see which databases I have. Well, I'm going to create a database called company. It could be any company. And we leave the UTF in before general CI selected. Let's create it. Now we have a database created in the system. At the top, you can see that we're using database company. So if you click on server again, we have the databases tab and then you can see the company database display here. If you select it, you are inside the database company. So this database will have, let's do the exact same tables that I show you in the spreadsheet, the users table, the countries, countries table and the friends table. So let's create a table called users and we need to check how many rows we need, how many columns. The first column will be for the ID, the name, the email, and the age. So we need four columns. Let's check it. One, two, three, four. And we also need the country column. So we need five columns. So we'll do five like so. We click on go. And now we can fill it up with data. The first column is the ID, and over here you have several options. The ID should be an integer, it cannot be a negative number, it should be auto increment, so it goes from 1 to 2 to 3, and it should never be null. To do all that, you can click on these boxes and select all of it, but in reality, you could just do the data type to be a serial. So if you look at my cursor, it says that serial is an alias for big int, it's unsigned, it's not null, it's out to increment, and it is unique, and that's what we need. So we select it. We also need the name. The name is going to be a var char. We're going to say that the length is 20, and you don't need anything else over here. Now we're going to do the email. The email will be a var char. We're going to say that the length is 255. This is the max length of an email. This is the max length of a name. So we also need the age. The age is not going to be an integer because look at the data types that you have. An int allows you to have this huge number. If you see, I cannot just move it there, but try to read with me. 
if you look at the last number, if the integer was not a negative number, it can go up to 4 billion 294 million, and then you get it there. So that is a huge number for an age. How about if we do a tiny int? Then if it is unsigned, it can go up to 255, and an age cannot be negative, so I will say that this is a tiny int, and this will be the age, and we need to tell it, don't mind all these other options, what we need to say is that it cannot be a negative number. So let's see what we have the on sign. Let me just move this a little bit to the right and look at the attributes column. And then we can say that the age is on sign. That means that it cannot be negative. If it is signed, that means that it can have a sign in front of the age, meaning that it could have the negative number. So it's on sign for now. And the last key, the last column we need is the country foreign key. And we call this FK country. Now with this data type, you need to be careful about. If you know that the country's ID will also be of type serial, and now you know that this is a begin, you know that this is unsigned, auto increment, this data type here has to be the exact same data type as that one, but it cannot be serial because it's not going to auto increment automatically. So what we need to know is that's a big end and that is unsigned. That's the important thing about it, unsigned. If this is a foreign key to this ID being, being a serial, it has to be the exact same data type, begin and unsigned. So let's do that. The FK country is going to be a big end and it's going to be unsigned. So we just drag this a little bit to the right and then we select unsigned. So with this, we have created the table. Now we just need to click. And before I save, let me show you about the engine. InnoDB allows you to have a lot of stuff that my ISAM doesn't have. For example, InnoDB allows you to have transactions it locks at row level, not at table level, if this was my ISAM or ISAM. If this was a SQLite database, the whole database gets locked whenever you do an insert, an update, or delete. So that's why you know, if it's much better than that. And it also allows you to have foreign keys constraints. So always select InnoDB. Now let's click on Save. And we have created our users table. Now we need to create the next table, which is the countries table. So let's do that. Let's go to the database company and let's create a new table. Let's give it a name, call it countries. And we need two columns. If you look at the description, we have an ID and a name. So let's build those two columns. In the countries table, two columns, we click on go. And now we have the ID. You already know about serial, so we select serial again. And then we have the name of the country. We're going to select a bar chart. I don't know what the longest country's na country name is in the world, but I will just do 255 for now. We select nothing else, and then we just say save. So now we have the country's table created. Let's create the last table, which is the friends having a user ID and a FK user ID. This is really weird. You could also call this user from ID. This is the from friend, and this will be the user to ID, meaning that the request came from friend one to friend two, or to user two. The request about the friendship came from user two, and it went to user three, and so on. So it doesn't really matter what you call these columns, but it is important to give a name that you will remember in the future. So for now, we just do user from ID and user to ID. Now, these are foreign keys for the table here. So this will be a foreign key. This one is a foreign key to this primary key, and this two is a foreign key to that primary key. 
So we could say foreign key user from ID and we can say foreign key user to ID. I hope you guys so uh, you understand what this means. So let's create these names. I will just copy this. And remember that this is the primary key being a serial. So now we know that's a serial and that means begin and on sign. So we're going to create the friends, friends table. Let's go to the database company. Let's create the friends table. Same again, two columns, click on go. And then I just paste the name of the table. You cannot select serial because this will be an auto increment unique and so on. So we select begin and the attribute will be on sign. For the next column, I just paste it and then I make a change from from to two, and this will also be a begin and it's going to be on sign. If you forget to select the on sign or if you select another data type, you will have collision issues between foreign keys and primary keys. So I will just save this table and now we have the structure of that created table. Let's have a look of the company's database again. Now you have the users table, the friends table and the countries table. All right, let's fill it up with data now. Inside the users table, just click on it. We're going to go to insert and I will fake the users. The ID is going to be given to us automatically. That's part of being a serial. So the name will be A, the email will be at A, and the age of this user will be 10. Now we're going to pretend that this user comes from, let's say, Denmark or the United States. Now you can see that this is not being auto filled up at all. So you wouldn't know about one being Denmark or two about, about being USA. And that's because we have not set the relations between the primary and the foreign keys. So before we save this, let's set up the relations. Let's go back to the database company. And now let's fill up the countries table because that is a table that doesn't need data from any other table. So let's click on countries and let's insert some data. We are going to say that we have as suggested in the example Denmark and then we have the other ID to be USA. So let's just say both of them by clicking on this go button and if you wanted to do this via a SQL command this is the command that you should run so you insert Denmark and the United States, USA in this case. So you could copy the command and then you could just run it from here. But that's a nice thing about this tool is that you don't really need to memorize the commands. You create something and then the command is given to you. Let's browse the table and now we have Denmark and USA. Let's go back to the database company. Let's select users and let's insert some data. Now over here, if this was Denmark, that will be one and you say will be two. Still, this is not giving us any options because we have not created the relations between the tables. So let's go to the structure of the table users again. So table users structure. And now we need to try to set the constraints between primary and foreign keys. So to set the constraint, let's go to the relation view. And we are going to this is not very obvious, but here you have the internal relationships. Right now, this is just a matter or way to tell PHP my admin that these tables are related. So we will expand it and we are in the users table. You can always see the table you are at the moment up here. So in the users table, we're going to say that we have a relationship in the foreign key country. The database is called company. And this relates to the countries, that's the table, and that relates to the column called ID. So we will just say save, and that's the relation we added. We have an internal relationship successfully updated, and then the column was successfully updated. So this is just for you as humans to understand that these 
tables are related. It's really not doing anything but that. So let's go now to the table users that we are there at the moment and we're going to insert some data. So now you can see that you have a drop down here. And if you insert the name A, the email at A, the age is 10. Now the foreign key country is related to the countries table. So as soon as you display the drop down, you can see that you can select Denmark with ID 1 or USA with ID 2 or vice versa. It doesn't really matter. You can just do one. I just click on one or you can click on two. I'm just pressing the keyboard one or the keyboard two keys and then I get the country. So we say that user A lives in Denmark. I will add user B being an add B. B will be 20 years old and he lives or she lives in the United States. We will click on go again. Now we have this insert command. If this was being executed via PHP or Python or Node.js or any other programming language, you will have to do the SQL command. So now you know that. Let's check the table users. Let's browse it. So now you know that A lives in this country. And since I set up the internal relationship, now you can literally go and click on one and it will show you that that's Denmark. Or I can browse again. Now I am in the countries table, by the way. So we'll go back to the users table. And then if you click on two, you don't even need to click if you don't want it. But if you have something else besides USA that's popping up in this tooltip, then you could just click and see it. Or one says Denmark. So now you can see how we set up this internal relation. So PHP, my admin, is helping us with that. So now let's go back to the new table. Let's go to, oh, let's put a new user, of course. We only have two. Let's add a new one. So insert C at C, that will be the main 30 and USA again. So now we have some users. Let's do this with the friends table. So if we go to the database company, we go to friends and we're going to insert some data. Now you can see that we don't have any internal relation. We don't know if user ID one exists. We don't know if user ID two exists because we have not set the internal relation for the friends table. So we should do that. So in the table friends, let's go to the structure and let's go to the relation view. In this kind of not obvious link, we just display it. And then we say that the users from ID refers to the users table, the ID of the user, and the users to ID refers to the users table and the ID of the user. Click on save and now we have a relationship. Let's go to the table friends and we insert now. Now you can see that automatically we can say that one is friends with two. If you look at this diagram, now we can say that two is friends with three. Two is friends with three. And then I will just say both of them. I will browse. Now you can see that one is friends with two, two is friends with three, and then I will insert a new element that says that one is also friends with three, just like we did here. One, three, that was the last one. All right, so we browse this, and now you can see that this is the relation. And now I'm going to make the mistake that I will add one and two again. So I go to insert, and we say that one is friends with two. The row was inserted. This was the command. And if we browse the data, we can see that one is friends with two and one is also friends with two. This should never have happened because I did not establish the compound or composite key. So to establish the key, we need to go to the structure of the friends table. And then we need to tell that both of these elements this and that combined, they will become the primary key. So the combination of this key with that key 
can never repeat again. So that will mean that we create, we select both of them, and then we say that this is a primary key. If you want to create a composite or compound key between more columns, that's also allowed. But in this scenario, we need both of them. So when I click on primary, we will see this error. It says you cannot create a compound, a primary key between those two columns because you already have duplicated data. So we need to clear the data. We can go to browse and you cannot really delete this manually. So what we need is just to get rid of all the data inside this column. So now I'm going to run a SQL command and I will show you how to clear the whole data. So we say truncate table friend. This means get rid of all the data inside the table friends, but leave, leave the table columns intact. So do not destroy the columns. And this, by the way, how you make a comment in SQL. Let's see, like so. Right now, this is the comment. Be careful. If you guys want to delete the whole table, you can say drop table friends. And this is a very dangerous command because this will literally destroy everything. Destroy the whole table. Data and columns. So you should never run this command, the, the drop table command, if you don't know exactly what you're doing. So now I'll show you the drop and the truncate. So for now, we're just going to run the truncate command. You can do it in two ways. You can click on go. You can also press control. And let me just show you this here. You can press control plus enter and then that will be the exact same thing as clicking on go down there. So I will just do a control enter now. As soon as I do that, it says that's a dangerous command. Are you sure? You say, okay. And now the table friends doesn't have any data. Let's go to the structure of the table. And now we're going to set the primary key being a compound key between those two fields. And now it is a primary key. So now let's fill it up up with some data. We will insert, then we say that A is friends with B, B is friends with C. We click on go. Now we're going to browse and now you can automatically see that since you actually created a compound key, now you're able to edit, copy or delete these elements. You can also click on one if you want to see that's A or click on two if you wanted to click there and that will take you to user B because we have this internal relation. Now I'm going to do also one being friends with C. So we'll insert one is friends with C and that is allowed. So when I browse, we can see that one is friends with C. The order doesn't matter. Leave the order running automatically. You cannot alter that. And I'm going to make a not a mistake, but I'm going to try to say that one is friends with two again. So one is friends with two. And then we have this error. If you were using a program to interact with the database, then you will have uh, probably in the catch, you will get this exception. And it's not allowed because the entry is duplicated. If you don't know how to get rid of that message, you can just try to click, nothing happens. Click on top of the window with a message and it disappears. So now you know that, add, that that was not allowed. And that's fine, that's what we wanted. So that is not enough, those are just internal relationships. Now we need to go and I want to show you how to create some constraints. And the constraint will be the following. If you pay attention to this diagram, what will happen if you delete user A, and that's user A. In a real application, you will probably not delete anything. You will just have an extra column that tells you the user is active or not. But if you wanted to delete user A, being this user there, then the friendship should also disappear. So if user one is gone from the system, this one and that one 
should also be gone from the system automatically. And this is called a constraint. So we can create a constraint and we can cascade on delete, meaning that if you delete this user, we will cascade the delete to the friends table and we will also delete whatever is referenced in the FK user from ID. To do that, we go to PHP my admin and we're going to create that constraint. So we select the sub table. In this case, that's the table. Let's see how we do this. Let's go to the friends table and let's create a constraint. So we go to the friends table, structure, and we're going to go to the relation view. And we are going to create the constraint that I told you about. So inside the friends table, the column called FK user from ID on the database called company on the table called users, we are going to refer to the ID. So if you don't understand how to read this, I'm just saying that the relationship between these two tables is between the user's ID to the friend's FK users from ID and both of them are inside this database called company. And here comes the constraint property. You can see it says here actually foreign key constraint. That's the terminology of it. So this is the foreign key and I'm creating a constraint. And I will say that on delete, if you say restrict, it means that you cannot delete. If you say cascade, it means that the deletion will, will cascade to this table. And if you delete from the user's table any ID, it will cascade to the friend's table. So I will just save this constraint. I'm not going to give it a name. I will just leave it without the name. Click on save. And now we have the constraint created. Let's go to the structure. And right now we don't see anything here, but the constraint is there. Um, probably somewhere here you can read about the constraint. I don't really see it. But we know that if we go to the relation view, we will find it right here. And this is a name that was given to us automatically. And that's the constraint. If you want to create a new constraint, you just fill this with data and the new constraint will be created with a new random given name. So let's go and browse the friends table. Now we know that one is friends with two, one is friends with three, and two is friends with three. Let's concentrate on two, three. Two, I click on it, it's the user B. So remember, in the table called friends, we have user two being B is friends with user three being C. So two, three. Let's go to the users table. And we're going to say that the user B is going to be deleted. So we click on delete and it says, do you really want to execute this command? Yes, I want to execute the command. And it says that one row was affected. So just for you to know it, that disappears automatically or click on that little message that you saw there. So now we don't have user B in the users table. Let's go to the friends table. And now you can see that the relationship between two and three that we previously had has disappeared. So user B was cascaded on the lead. So everything related to B is gone from this table you see here. So that is about foreign keys, primary keys, constraints and the relationship between them. It's also about the compound key that I show you here. And this is really important. These two keys make a compound key. And how do you know it? It's by looking down here. It says indexes. We have a primary key that is built from this column and that column there. So if you're in doubt about the compound key, look at this primary and see how many keys made the primary, how many columns made the primary key. Let's go to the users table to see the difference there we can see that the users table 
does not have, oh, sorry, let's go to the structure. The users table has the ID, which is the unique key. And it's not a compound key because it's only one column, the ID column. But whenever you create databases and you want them to perform fast, this is a topic about when do you index a field, a column. You index basically if you, want, if you are going to search for that column. So are you ever going to search for the age? Are you going to create a command that says, give me all the users whose age is 10? If the answer is yes, then you will index the age. But most likely we're just going to say that the name has to be indexed because we're going to search by name. As an example, if you want to search by name, you will index the name and therefore, if you go to more on the name, you can say that, uh, yeah, there, that this is going to be indexed. So we can say that this is index. We click on it. And if you wanted to run this command from any other programming language, you can just do this command here. I don't intend to memorize commands because I will forget them. I just use the user interface. So I will say yes, and as soon as I click on yes, now you can see that the name has been indexed. And I know that because in here it says indexes. The name is indexed. Now let me show you how you could also look at this. You have this key there, that means that's an index. That's an index, and it means that it's very, very fast to search for something if they are indexed. In the SQL command, you can do this select all and you can have the select select insert update delete if you forget the command just click on those buttons right let me just click on select select all from users you don't need these back ticks just select all from users but i want to select the name from users select name from users i will do a control enter and then you have the select command that displays the data over here. If you click on edit inline, you can do explain. And with explain, the database will tell you what it is looking for and how it's taking over the execution of the command. So we click on go. And now it says that this was a simple select type and it's looking at the table users and it is indexed. So it knows how to use the index. So try to remember this. It says simple users index. So I will edit in line and then I will select the email with explain in front of it. When I click on go, you can see that the email doesn't have an index. The table users, there's no index for email. So you should index the email because pretend that you want to log in. So a login will say select the field email that matches the email given by the user and the password that matches the, game, the, the password given by the user. So usually the email, it's also indexed. So this is the column, the row for the email. So you say more. Don't click on it, just put your cursor on top of it and say index. Alter table users and add index email. Yes, that's what we want. And as soon as you add the new index, you can see that the ID, the name, and the email have been indexed. There are other commands that you can look up. So if we say SQL tab, the select is this command, select all from users. Let's just run it. Now we have an issue here. You have an error in my syntax. I just make a change, it didn't work out. I can go to SQL again and try to rerun it. Control enter, I get the data, just for you to see some errors. If you just click on select, this says select ID, name, email, age, foreign country from users with ID equals one, you get the data out. If you don't know how to do an insert, you click on insert, and in here you just have to replace the values. You don't need all these, this is quite advanced, but basically it says that you want to insert into users ID, the name, email, and so on, and then the values. So this, you don't really need it. It's used. It's pretend that you want to insert the ID. The ID by default will be a null. 
this is the first column that would be the first value then you could insert a name that could be let's say D then the email will be at D and we have the age I will just pretend that D is 40 <clears throat> And we have the foreign key for the country that that will be one. So these values don't need to be inside double quotes because those are integers. So no need for double quotes. You don't really need these ticks here, but ticks. So we just get rid of them so you can see the whole command. Now this is useful. This command is useful if you want to reverse the order of the elements. So let's pretend that you wanted to do this. Let's say that you want to move the name here to the end. I never do it, but just pretend that you want to do that. That means that ID will be the first value. The email will be the second value. So this is not going to be D. The email is going to be the second value. The age will be the third. The foreign country, the fourth. And the name will be the last value. I don't suggest you do this, never flip this around. It's not going to move the structure of the table around. It's literally just going to move the execution of the command around, but the final data will be the same. I don't use it. So we'll do insert again. I actually always do this. I say insert into users. I don't tell the specific fields. And then I just say which values I want to insert. Since I know the structure of the table, and if you don't know, by the way, look at the right side hand here. It says ID, name, email, age, and country. So just by picking here, you will know that ID is out to increment its zero. So we say null. The name is D. I'm just looking here. Then comes the email. I will say at D. Then we have the age, 40. And we have the country, let's say Denmark. Control, enter. And then this has been inserted. Let's browse the data. And then we have the user D that comes from Denmark in this case. So this is how you can run SQL commands. I show you in the previous section of the video about the truncate and the drop command. You can also delete. So if you say delete from users where ID equals one, this will be deleting user A, if we had user A, or two, that will be B, we don't have it now, so I just run it. And it says, well, several rows were affected. I didn't want to delete A because I want to have some data in my database. So now you can see that B was not affected. If we go to SQL again, we can do some other commands. I will show you, if you want to know how many elements you have in this table, you can say, select count all from users and this command will tell you that we have three users in the table i will edit in line and you don't want the column to be called count all let me just run it again so you can see count parentheses all so i will edit in line and i will create what's known as an alias so we'll say select count as that's the alias and then we just say total is with small letters, lowercase letters. Hit control enter and then you say that the total is a new column name. This is known as an alias. I will show you another command. If you want to know who is the oldest of all these users, you can use the max and then we are going to say select max age from users. And then you have the max age being 40. Now, you don't like this column name. Obviously not, that's a very bad name for a column. So we're going to create an alias and then we're just going to say as oldest. Now you know that the oldest is 40. I will do the opposite. I will find the youngest user. So I will say mean age, youngest. And then the youngest is 10. Another command that you could run, pretend that you want to know the average age of all your users, you can run the avg command. I think these are called aggregated commands. I will put uh, the correct word of it in the video description. 
AVG H as average. Average. Now we have the average between the age of all the users is 26.6667. So these are a few of the commands that you can do. I will show another one. Just pretend that you want to select the name from users. So all the name from the users, let's select everything from the users. Select all from users where the name, not starting with A, not ending with A, you can just do a like command. And this takes quite a long time, even though your database has been indexed in the name column, then if you say like percentage a percentage it will search for any person whose name contains a letter a maybe in the beginning maybe in the middle of the name maybe at the end of the name so we just copy this command right now it's hard to demonstrate because i don't have complex names so i just copy that i will go to browse in the table users and then i will just change the name. This name will be A, let's call it Amanda. Let's call one row affected, yes. The C will be Charlie and the D will be, just click on the message, Donald. And then just click there, so it disappears. So now you have Amanda, Charlie and Donald. You can see that all of them have a letter A in between. So let's go to the SQL command. I just pasted what I copied before. When I run it, we get Amanda, Charlie and Donald. Remember that CI is case insensitive. That means that capital A or lowercase a, lowercase a will give us the same commands. Now let's look for a name that contains the letter H. So editing line, I wish is to the letter H and run it. Charlie is there. Another command, if you want any name that starts with the letter A followed by anything else, that's how you do it. If you want the opposite, you want any name that contains any data and ends with the letter A, remember it's case insensitive, so it doesn't matter if I capitalize it or not, then you get Amanda. So that is how you can do the like command. These commands are um, useful via the buttons and there are a lot of different things you can do with databases. So um, before I go into the inner join, which is something complicated, if you want to back up your database, it's quite simple. Let's just click the database company, select it. And now you can just click on export. And when you export it, uh, which is say go, you get a file. Click on the file. Let's see, this open in my computer in VS Code, that's fine. You don't need extension. And over here you have all the information about the database. If you did not have the GUI PHP my admin in this case, this is the command that you should run to create a countries table. This is the command that you should run to create, to insert data in the countries table. This command will work with the friends table, so you can see how you can create it, how you can insert values. The same command for the users table, how you can insert values into it, and so on. And here you have the indexes. The index, the index, the compound index, Sorry, this is the index for the users table. Sorry, those are three indexes, the ID, the name, and the email. And here you have the modification, modif modified indexes. So this is what you should, or you could try to remember, but going through this is time consuming and you will forget it most likely right away. So I don't suggest that you do that. So just use the GUI. Now, once you have exported the database, you can always go back and import it. So you click on import, and then you're going to choose the file that you just exported. In my case, it's on the downloads, it's company SQL, and then I could open it, and then I could run it.
but I'm not going to click on go because I have not deleted my database. But just in case that you destroy your database, you can always import it back. Another thing I want to show you, click on the database company, go to more, and you can go to the designer. And over here you have, it's not fancy at all, it's a very, very basic designer. And here you have an overview of how your database is connected. You can see that the users has a foreign key to the countries table. You can see the diagram here. This is called an entity relational diagram. I'm not going to talk a lot about it in this video, but it's coming in the future videos. And you can see that this is the primary key. And you can see that this is the foreign key. Do you see the hashtag, the number symbol? That's a foreign key and that's the primary key. Over here, we have the big int for the users that points to this compound key. So this is how you can read a diagram. There are many, many tools that do this in a much nicer way, but this is okay as a quick overview. So you can just print this if you want it. The other thing I want to show you is about store procedures, also called routines. So in my database, I don't have any routines. Just for you to know it, a routine is basically a function that is declared in the database. So let's create a new function, a new routine. Let's give it a name. Let's call it get users. And usually you can give some parameters, arguments in here, if you want to refer to the procedure and pass some data to it. It's a function that you can pass arguments to it. So if you wanted to pass an argument, you will fill this with data. For the sake of the exercise of the example, I will say select all from users. So this is a hard coded select statement and it's going to be called inside the get users function. There are many things that you can go and read about. I'm not going to walk you through all these. I will just click on go and it says missing value in the form. So Let's just say, okay, and we're going to go and we say in is going to take a name if that's what we want. Let me just do underscore name. It's going to be a bar char and the length of it is going to be max 20. Don't mind this char, let's leave it there. So select all from users where the name equals the name. And this here is the argument that I'm using there. Let's see if this does the job. Let's just click on go. And now my routine, my function has been created. If you wanted to do this without the GUI, this is the command that you should know. So you can see that it's really, really complex. Better run it like this. What's the advantage of the routine of the store procedure is the following. When you execute the procedure, now the name will be the letter A that I'm searching for, I click on go and I don't have any names with the letter A. I'm trying to find the exact match. I know that I have a name called Amanda, so let's execute it, Amanda. Now we have the result. Now you don't see the advantage of it, but imagine that you're using Python or PHP or any other programming languages. Instead of you running the select command, this command here. Instead of you running the command that we had before in the procedure, what you do is you could, let me just open this code, you could do this. Once you want to trigger the function, usually you will do call get users and then you will pass the value that you are searching for, Amanda. And this will give you the rows back. So you no longer need to know that the select command is select all from users where the name equals and then the value that you pass in here. So this is an abstraction layer. When you create a routine, the person in charge of creating the routine is not the coder, coding the application, is the database administrator. So that person is the one that creates the functions, the procedures for you, 
and it says, well, I have a procedure called get users and it will return you all the users. So in your code, you will just say this and that will give you the data back. I hope it's clear. It's coming more about this topic in the future videos. All right, and the last topic I want to talk about in this video, I'm not going to get to inner joints, those thought that will be covered in the next video. It is about privileges. So go to the database company, select the user rights privileges here. And over here you can create users that can interact with your database as administrators of it. These are not the users of your system. Pretend that you have a company and you have customers. This privileges is not for the customers of your database, it's for the employees of the company that have access to the database to create, for example, routines, to export it, to import it, to create the structures, to create SQL commands and stuff like that. So to demonstrate the topic, I'm going to add a new user account. So you can give a username, pretend that you get a job in this company and your name is called XXXXX. And then I will say that you will be interacting via local host. I will create a password for you. I will retype the password or you can just generate the password automatically like so. And this will be the password. So you are hiding the company that's your name, that's your password. And at the moment, I'm not going to give you all the privileges to my database because I don't truly trust you. So I say, no, you cannot do everything in my database. I want you to start working with it. So I would just say that with the data, you will be able to select the data you're not going to be allowed to insert the data, update, delete, or create files on it. So this could be just a select. And that means that you start coding the application, you will connect to the database with this username and that password. And the only thing you could do, pretend that you're in PHP or Python. So the only thing that you could do is you could create a select command from the application, select all from users, and this will run and this will give you all the users because I allowed you to select, but you cannot insert, update and delete or any of these other queries, right? Especially not drop. Imagine that by mistake, I give you all the privileges and then I just say check all, for example. Then you access the database, you access PHP my admin or via a SQL command in VS code you could do this, drop table users. If you run this with the username XXXXXX and the password, it will literally destroy the table users. And if you log in in PHP my admin with this username and that password, you could literally drop the table. So it's very important that you create users depending on the administrative rights you want to give to them. By default, I'm connected, connected as root. So you can see that I'm using this, forget about this. I can just delete it. I'm not going to do that, but I'm using root and I have all the privileges. And that's why I could create databases. I could drop and interact with the data as I want it. Okay, thank you very much for watching this video. Please do not forget to subscribe and do not forget to hit the notifications icon because I will be creating more videos on top of this topic. And whenever an update comes to the market, I will make the update and then you will know about it. And the way you can see that, it is that in here you have version 2020 March. If you're watching this video, and you look at the description of the video in the comment section, maybe there will be a new version for it. So it will probably be called 2020, let's say July, who knows. Okay, guys, thank you very much for this video.